And I have to step in here and request that Mr. Brooks be instructed to stop making comments under his breath. This witness is very clearly having an emotional and difficult time testifying, and she doesn't need to hear that. Objection, she can't hear anything I'm saying. Mr. Brooks, the mics are very good in this courtroom. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin and this is Just Thought Lounge. JTL is the true crime channel that delivers serious, well-balanced coverage of the cases that really make you think. Today we're taking a look at the shocking and tragic events that took place at the annual Christmas parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin on the 21st of November, 2021. Parade goers watched in shock and horror as a red SUV traveling at an estimated 40 or even 50 miles per hour came barreling down Main Street in the historic downtown core of the small Milwaukee suburb. The sound of the marching band, chatter and laughter, was quickly overtaken with screams from onlookers and calls for help as the vehicle drove through the parade procession without stopping. In the chaos, the driver escaped, but not for long. A rapid and straightforward investigation pieced together the events, almost all caught on camera. Yet this case still culminated in one of the most bizarre and unpredictable trials in recent memory. This is the shocking case of the Christmas parade and the trial of Daryl Brooks. Let's take a look. For nearly 60 years on the Sunday before American Thanksgiving, the town of Waukesha, Wisconsin, near Milwaukee, has held its annual Christmas parade. Local businesses, community groups, and associations make up the parade lineup. In 2021, this included the Varsity Cheer Club, marching bands, the Old Car Club, and the Dancing Grannies, to name just a few. At the very end of the parade, of course, was a special appearance from Santa Claus. The festivities on the 21st of November, 2021, began as they did in any other year. The theme was comfort and joy. Children handed out candy, families lined the streets in anticipation. The parade itself commenced around 4 p.m. Just after 4.30 p.m., parade attendees spotted a red SUV traveling quickly on a blocked off road heading in the direction of the parade procession that had passed by only moments before. After breaking through barricades, the vehicle had taken a right turn onto Main Street, where a witness said it revved its engine before accelerating into the parade route. Witnesses recounted the rapid speed of the vehicle. Others noticed that it was honking. Some commented that the vehicle appeared to be veering from right to left in a kind of zigzag pattern, either to avoid those in its path or to target them. The scene was chaotic. It was unclear. Gunfire was heard in the vicinity of the vehicle. This was later determined to be law enforcement firing at the SUV in an attempt to stop it. In the chaos, some parade attendees registered only the noise of the shots and thought that it came from the red SUV out into the crowd. After traveling several blocks, the vehicle approached a group of parade participants rapidly from behind. The vehicle did not stop. It kept going all the way down the block to People's Park, the stoplight, and continued straight through it. It's a little bit difficult to process, you know, just especially how fast everything went when we, it was, when we were downtown. You know, we, you think in hindsight about what response you could have to stop the guy. And it's just, you know, even, even if I was right in front of it, it would have been hard to stop. Law enforcement, emergency personnel, and bystanders rushed to the assistance of those who had been struck by the vehicle. In the aftermath, there was chaos and confusion. People were uncertain whether they had witnessed a deliberate act or an accident. Belongings were abandoned along the sides of the street as people rushed to either assist or for a safe place. Storefronts along Main Street opened up to hundreds of people on the street who rushed inside. Many people could be heard calling out for their family members. It's just absolute chaos, people screaming. This doesn't happen here. Like, I don't, I don't understand. Why? I, I really don't understand why. It's just kids having a good time for Christmas, and then this SUV comes barreling through. There were five parade participants that died at the scene. Tamara Durand, 52, had been marching with the Milwaukee Dancing Grannies for the first time. 
She worked as a teacher and was a chaplain at the Waukesha Memorial Hospital. Virginia Ginny Sorensen, 79, volunteered to carry a banner at the Waukesha Christmas Parade. She was a registered nurse and also a member of the Dancing Grannies. Another member of the group, Leanna Lee Owen, was 71 years old. She was from Kudahi, Wisconsin and worked as an apartment manager. She left behind two sons. Wilhelm Hospital, at the age of 81, was the oldest victim of the Waukesha Christmas Parade crash. He was at the parade supporting his wife, Lola, who was a dancing granny as well. Jane Kulik, 52, had marched with a citizen's bank float. Jane had been described as a loving, beautiful, and charismatic mother, grandmother, and friend to so many. There were 62 individuals with additional injuries, including 18 children who were sent to hospital. The Red Ford Escape was discovered abandoned by the driver a few blocks away from the parade route in the driveway of a house. The neighbor next door said the SUV first drove through his backyard and sideswept a car in his driveway. The driver of the SUV was seen leaving the vehicle. He was wearing a gray sweatshirt, blue jeans, and sporting dreadlocks. Security cameras across the neighborhood captured the man's movements. He hid for a time in a child's playhouse where he discarded his gray sweatshirt, perhaps in an attempt to disguise himself. Now in a red t-shirt, the man was easily spotted on subsequent cameras as he made his way through the neighborhood, roughly a half mile away from the carnage on Main Street. As the victims of the incident were cared for and rushed off to hospital, law enforcement mobilized across the area to seek out the driver of the red SUV. Despite the proximity of the parade to the homes a half mile away, news of what had occurred did not immediately reach the residents. Daniel Ryder, who'd been away on a hunting trip and was watching football when the crash occurred, said he had no idea about what had just happened. At just after 5 p.m., a man came to his door, shaking from the cold. He was captured on Daniel's doorbell camera. Hey, can I, I call some, I called an Uber, and I'm supposed to be waiting for it over here, but I don't know when it's coming. Can you call it for me, please? It had been only 20 minutes since the SUV had torn through the parade route barricades, killing five people instantly and injuring dozens more. Daniel invited the man inside and gave him a jacket, made him a sandwich, and let him use his phone. Outside, however, he could see police culminating on the street and he became nervous. Daniel asked the man to leave, which he did. But after another neighbor phoned the police, the man began to pound on the door again, claiming to have left his ID inside. My ID! My ID! Put your hands up! Put your hands where I can see them! Put your hands up! Hands up! Hands up! Get on the ground! Get on the ground! Do it now! The man was arrested and brought in for questioning. His driver's license, which was found in his pocket, identified him as 39-year-old Daryl Brooks. Also in his pocket was a key to the wrecked Ford Escape, abandoned off of the parade route, which was registered in the name of his mother, Dawn Woods. We're no longer looking for a suspect vehicle. We do have a person of interest in custody at the moment, but this is still a very fluid investigation. Daryl told investigators that a friend had driven him to Waukesha in his car. There he met with his ex-girlfriend, Erica Patterson, with whom he shares a teenage daughter. The two spoke briefly, and then he left, he said, on foot. Daryl denied driving the red SUV. I'm trying to be as open and honest with you as I can be. You know, I'm Christian too, and believe me, I'm not perfect. And neither are you. And I'm not calling you a terrible man. I'm not saying you were out yesterday hunting and just let me finish. But you did not walk to that house. You did not walk to that house. You did not come here in a tan Kia. You didn't. No. You did not come out here in a tan Kia. Okay. You've got a key in your pocket to a car, your mom's name. Okay. And that key works for that car. For the love of God, Marcus. For yourself, for your family. 
You know what happened yesterday for the people. Tell me what happened. Well, what? With the car. What am I being with your mom's for? car? You're driving goofy. People called in. You drove out of there in your mom's car, the red car. You're driving a little silly, probably because you're pissed. You met up with Erica in the car at the park. Now, initially, I believe you told us the gas station. Do I have that right? A red Ford Escape. She got in. You talked. And what you're telling me seems pretty consistent that there was nothing physical between the two of you. No, I mean, no. But you met her in the car. I didn't put my hands on her. Or nothing but like you that. met her in the car. Can, what's going on, man? I'm asking you a question. Just be. You were out there driving kind of crazy. crazy. On, Some man. people said you were driving kind of crazy. We got reports of it. You got the key. You got the car. Did you take the car? or Did your mom give you the car? I know you know what car I'm talking about. I just want to know. <laughs> so. Some people now, reported this, you all those okay, people no, 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 reported that no. car driving a bit erratic. I, I know what you're saying. All I'm saying is this. All I'm saying is this. We all been straight up with each other. You knew it was more to what you was asking me yesterday. Didn't know that would sure. explain that would explain the FBI and all that, right? They're not here today. So if it's that big a deal, you don't see them here today. Come on, car. Hey, we been, we been. You just met in the car, in the park. We been cool, yeah, man, the whole time. If I did something, yeah. if I did something yeah, wrong, that's serious, why they were here. But do you see them here today? They're not here today. Yeah, but, but y'all lied to me, man. You made it seem like they just come for no reason. Well, here's the thing, Darrell. And I'm like, what hey, if I if it's listen today to for a minute? I can, I, apologize. Give you a, I can give I, you a clean slate I, here. I, I apologize. Because you have lied to us as well. Because you came out here in the Red Ford Escape. Okay, that is what you came out here in. You had the key. All right? So. Overnight, law enforcement continued to interview Daryl Brooks. They found that he had an extensive criminal history already across multiple states beginning with substantial battery charges against him made in Milwaukee County back in 1999. He had arrests for drug abuse as well as various violent incidents. In November 2006, Darrell was convicted of statutory sexual seduction after impregnating a 15-year-old girl in Sparks, Nevada. He was required to register as a sex offender. In the following years, he would repeatedly be caught disobeying these registration laws. In 2007, while in custody in Reno, Nevada, Daryl was interviewed for a documentary about methamphetamine addiction called Crystal Darkness. In the interview, Daryl speaks about his goals to be a good father before being caught up in addiction. I didn't think about, you know, I got this, I got this beautiful kid who's, who's going without my time I thought I would just be this wonderful father, this, just be the greatest dad ever. You know, the vision is just like, I'm gonna give him everything that I didn't have. But then it's like, reality set in. You actually become the drug, not even a human being, basically. That's, that's how I felt. Like I wasn't, I wasn't a human anymore. I was just something, something vile, disgusting, despicable. I could go, I could go on, I could use a lot of words, but that's, that's what I became. It's, it's really what I became. A few years later in 2011, and back in Wisconsin, Daryl was charged with resisting an officer during a traffic stop. During the stop, he turned on his car and put it in drive. The officer said he feared Daryl Brooks was going to run him over. By 2021, Daryl had spent over 20 years in and out of jail in Wisconsin, Nevada, and Georgia. But he also, crucially, had a long history of mental illness first seeking treatment at the age of 12. 
Daryl's mother, Dawn, has stated that he suffers from bipolar disorder and a personality disorder. Without his medication, she described him as explosive. I've been hearing Daryl slowly slipping for the past two months. Shouting, it's acting out, it's throwing chairs, it's destroying things. It's all of the above. It's like someone setting off a time know when the manic is going to end and how far it's going to go. On November 5th, only weeks before the Christmas parade, Daryl had been released on a $1,000 bond after running over his ex-girlfriend with a vehicle. On the day of the Christmas parade, Daryl arranged through a mutual acquaintance to meet with his ex-girlfriend Erica, the same ex with whom his heated exchange earlier on in the month had landed him in jail. The security camera for a nearby school captured Erica in a blue jacket, getting out of the Red Ford Escape after speaking with Daryl. She returns moments later, followed by two friends, Corey and Nick. An altercation ensued, which occurred behind the obscured view of the security camera. A second camera partially captured the encounter. During the argument, Daryl was outside of the vehicle, facing off with Erica's friend and roommate Corey, who claimed he had swerved to try to hit Erica with his vehicle before she ran up to the scene. Erica reported being struck in the face by Daryl while they argued. Nick called the police. Exaggerating to elicit a rapid response, he claimed on the call that Daryl was in possession of a knife, which he was not. Regardless, this call to police prompted Daryl to drive off, but not before threatening to kill his ex-girlfriend. Minutes later, after walking Erica and Corey back to the women's shelter where they were staying, Nick watched as the same red SUV sped off towards Main Street. He said it took off like a bat out of hell and watched as it drove through a crowd of people. State believed that it was this domestic dispute with Erica that had led to Daryl's rage-fueled rampage into the Christmas parade. But it was five charges of first-degree intentional homicide in addition to roughly 70 other counts relating to other victims' injuries and weapons charges that were brought against Daryl Brooks. On the day of his bond hearing, news came of a sixth heartbreaking death. Eight-year-old Jackson Sparks had succumbed to his injuries at the Wisconsin Children's Hospital his 12-year-old brother, Tucker, also seriously injured at the parade, would make a full recovery. Daryl Brooks' charges increased from five to six indictments for first-degree murder. He could be seen crying in the courtroom. His bail was set at $5 million, so he remained in custody. In February 2021, Daryl entered a plea of not guilty, followed by an insanity plea a few months later. But as the trial date approached, his defense took a turn when in early September, his public defenders requested to withdraw from the case. Daryl Brooks would represent himself and he was revoking the insanity defense. What has led to Daryl's behavior? 
his mental illness not being medicated. He always says, you know, Mama, I'm fighting for my life. And I said, I know that, baby. But we have to look at reality for what it is. What is it? You know, I said, you did do what they said you did, even though it wasn't intentional, but you did, you know, and you're going to have to go to prison. Daryl's not an attorney. How do you think he's going to handle the proceedings? I'm going to, and I hate to say this, you're going to see manic, full-blown. That's what you're going to see. The trial for the state v. Daryl Brooks has been accurately described as a legal circus, exactly what Don Woods had predicted and hoped to avoid. But Judge Doro had determined that Daryl Brooks was competent to stand trial and articulate and intelligent enough to represent himself. Nobody, ain't nobody gonna talk to me like that. Nobody. I don't have a problem with doing what you ask me to do, not tell me. Just like when I ask you about subject matter jurisdiction that you have yet to prove on the record. But somehow I'm being intentionally disruptive uh, come on man stop just stop it i have to step in here and request that mr brooks be instructed to stop making comments under his breath this witness is very clearly having an emotional and difficult time testifying and she doesn't need to hear that objection she can't hear anything i'm saying mr brooks the mics are very good in this courtroom no, there ain't no police. You are nothing. being disruptive. Ain't you no are being disrespectful. You're, you're always going to find some reason to down. say somebody's being disruptive because they want the truth to be out there. Man, quit it. You're supposed to be Mr. the judge. Mr. Brooks, I'm advising you that continued interruptions will result in you forefitting your right to okay, be present in this court. Under what, under what law in fact can you do that? Illinois versus Allen. Okay, sir. what, the fourth, the fourth uh, option that you made up that's not even in the uh, law? Mr. Because Brooks, you can't do that. I need to make a By ruling. law, you can't do that. I need to make and you a know finding. you can't. All right, I'm going to um, excuse everyone. Mr. Brooks is being removed from the courtroom. He will continue in the neighboring courtroom. Uh, please make sure he has his objection signed and a pad of An empty courtroom next to the one where the proceedings were taking place served as a kind of timeout zone where Darrell was sent with some regularity when he refused to comply with court instructions. Furthermore, to that, I'm not because that's a lie. Let him at finish. The day, let him we, finish. We're gonna open the Mr. door on that. No, since he want to make a record and not be accurate, so let's be ac accurate all on the record. Since you think you know so much, once so again, we can Mr. open Brooks the door on. We can open the door on how old she told me she was. Interrupting. We, we can ask He's, that question. He is too, over the top animated right now. Do you know that? that, Mr. Brooks? I'm ordering you to sit down and to let the state no, finish. No, no, I'm not going to sit here and let somebody be inaccurate on the record and lie on the record. Right. Under Illinois versus Allen, I've warned him repeatedly. He's being removed from the courtroom. Judge Doro had the ability to mute this room. When she took advantage of this, Brooks was reduced to holding up his objection sign at which point he would be allowed to speak briefly to address his concerns. I thought I, was supposed to, I thought I was supposed to be unmuting. You are now. All right, uh, Attorney Offer, you may start. Daryl's antics did not cease once he was removed to the neighboring courtroom. In one incident, he became non-responsive and hid behind a stack of legal boxes, forcing bailiffs to remove them. After a particularly heated encounter, Daryl stripped off his shirt and paced the room and threatened to break items. This occurred on the same day he refused to wear his suit to court, despite the chance that it served as a visual bias to the jury. Criminal trespass to dwelling from 2006. Right, I need to take a break. This man right now is having a stare down with me. It's very disrespectful. He pounded his fist. Frankly, it makes me scared. As the trial neared conclusion, most observers were still unable to pinpoint exactly what the defense argument was, though there was a laundry list of assertions being made. The first was the declaration by Darrell that he was a sovereign citizen. Essentially, he insisted that despite residing in the country, he conveniently does not accept that he is a citizen of it, and as such, he cannot be bound by US laws, the rules of the court, or any other government authority. Judge Dora rejected his attempts to use the sovereign citizen defense, finding it to be meritless. This did not stop Daryl from questioning the court's jurisdiction over him, 
repeatedly. Subject matter jurisdiction has Sir, to please. be proven for the record. It has please to be not. proven. It has to be proven. You know that just as well as Mr. Brooks. You know that. Please do not make statements that mischaracterize the law. You know it has to be proven or that impugn the, the integrity of this court. You know it has to be proven and the on the record. Proceedings here. You know the it jury has to is be proven. advised to disregard the statements that Mr. Brooks is making regarding subject matter jurisdiction. They are not evidence, and you are to disregard them. In another bizarre attempt to divert all responsibility outright. Daryl Brooks began to insist that he was not, in fact, Daryl Brooks. He did not legally recognize his own name or consent to being called to Daryl Brooks. In part, this seemed to be based on an objection to court records that contained his name typed in all capital letters. As prosecution witnesses took the stand and referred to him by name, he registered his objections, on the record, each time. How would you describe Mr. Brooks's haircut today? Objection, I don't consent to being called that name. Oh. Sir, I understand your objection. Please do not interrupt with that further so that the questioning of the witnesses may continue. You may answer. If you say that name, I'm objecting. And the jury will disregard the objection if it's solely for the name purposes. Accepting that Daryl Brooks is Daryl Brooks and that he is a U.S. citizen, the defense then suggested that the driver of the SUV could not be identified. He questioned many of the victims and other parade witnesses as to whether they had clearly viewed the driver of the vehicle. The underlying assertion was that whoever the defense was claiming to be, he was not driving the SUV, despite being captured on camera doing so. Mr. Brooks, do you have any questions for this witness? Yes, I do, and I object to being called that name for the record. I was positive that I was positive it was you. Who is you? You. I'm looking at you. To further establish this point, the prosecution introduced a music video of the man previously known as Daryl Brooks. In the video, the defendant is seen rapping in front of the same red Ford Escape that was later weaponized to commit the alleged murders. Just testify that this was the alleged defendant. How do you know that? Can you see a face? Which question are you asking? Those were two. Can you see the face <coughs> on the circle individual in that exhibit? In this club, I cannot see the face of the person that is circled. So how do you know who it is? I can tell who that is because I have watched this video in its entirety and I can tell that it is you based on all of my contacts with you. The Waukesha District Attorneys called 57 witnesses to the stand over 11 days, including police officers, parade goers, victims, family members of victims, and nearby residents who encountered Daryl Brooks the day of the parade. In her closing statement, District Attorney Susan Opper drew a necessary distinction in their case between that of intention and motive. Although the state argued that Daryl was prompted into a rage by his argument with Erica, this does not translate into a motive to injure and kill strangers. At no point did the state present a motive. Legally, they didn't need to. But also chillingly, they admitted to not knowing what the motive was. It was just senseless. The key charges of first degree murder, however, required they prove intent. And that intent was obvious. District Attorney Opper said, it was in Daryl Brooks's actions when he drove through the crowd and just kept going. The big things in this case has always been, why did this happen? What was he thinking? Why did he do this? Again, those are things I don't necessarily have to prove to you. His intent, I do have to prove, and I submit without any doubt there's overwhelming evidence that this was an intentional act by Daryl Brooks and an act of utter disregard for human life. I say that for these reasons, folks. Number one, first and foremost, just stop driving. That's intent, folks. 
no reasonable person is going to come across a group of teenagers playing band instruments, drive over them, and keep going. The defense argued that there was no intent. Witnesses had testified that the SUV was honking its horn, a warning to the individuals in its way. Furthermore, based on no evidence whatsoever, it was argued that the SUV itself was defective and could not be stopped. This assertion was in direct opposition to testimony already presented by the prosecution at trial. A mechanical inspector for the Wisconsin State Patrol examined the Red Ford Escape and he did not find any problems with it that could have interfered with the vehicle's ability to steer, accelerate, or brake. Which brings me back to the vehicle. What if the vehicle couldn't stop because of the malfunction? Objection fact, not in evidence. What if, what if the driver of the vehicle was unable to stop the vehicle? Does that make the driver a a crazed or not crazed, a, 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 a rage. Does that make the driver in a rage and intent on killing people? You have the decision. The jury deliberated for an hour and a half after a long final day in court. By 11 a.m. the next morning, the verdict was in on all 76 counts. We, the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, Guilty of first-degree intentional homicide. Each of the six first-degree murder convictions carries a mandatory life sentence. Judge Doro is tasked with deciding the sentencing on the other 70 charges. These will be handed down at a hearing in mid-November. It is expected that over 30 victims will offer impact statements at this hearing. Hopefully, someone, this will bring awareness to mental illness via our senators and our governors and elected officials, court, police. Very little help is done for individuals who are incarcerated with mental illness. Daryl Brooks has 20 days from sentencing to file a notice that he intends to appeal his conviction, which he plans to do. In fact, it has been widely speculated that much of his bizarre behavior and endless objections were in part purposefully designed for this one central purpose, to build a case for appeal and to have the conviction overturned. There's been some discussion since the verdict was announced that uh, perhaps the decision to represent himself is grounds for appeal. Are you concerned at all about that? Well, Mr. Brooks has a right to an, an appeal. Every defendant does. And I fully expect him to take advantage of his rights as a convicted defendant in this case. I am very confident in the record that Judge Doro made and his decision to represent himself. Yes. It will take months, if not years, for this appeal to the case to be filed, presumably by one or more qualified lawyers. And that was the tragic case of the Waukesha Christmas Parade and the bizarre trial of Daryl Brooks. Thanks for watching. I'm Kevin. This is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one.